My daughter's bedroom has carpeted floors. They're worn out and need to be replaced. So we're going to figure out one way to remove the carpet and replace it with vinyl plank flooring. The first step was to remove the baseboard. The existing baseboard in this room were held into place with finish nails and a bead of caulking was run to fill the gap between the wall and the baseboard. I score the top edge of the baseboard before removing it so that the caulking doesn't pull the paint off with it. I then use a putty knife and a hammer to pry the baseboard off the wall. If you're careful, you can usually save these pieces of baseboards and reuse them later. I'm not going to be reusing this baseboard, so I don't worry about keeping the baseboard intact, just getting it off the walls. Once my baseboard is removed, I use a utility knife to cut the carpet into strips. Strips two to three feet wide tend to work well for me. I make four or five passes with the utility knife, then pull up the carpet. Under the carpet is carpet padding. This also gets removed. With this strip removed, we cut another and remove that as well. I work my way through the room, removing baseboard as I go, then cutting and removing strips of carpet and padding. Once all the carpet is removed and out of the room, I start to remove the carpet tack strip, which is installed around the perimeter of the room, as well as the staples that held the carpet padding in place. I found a hammer and a flathead screwdriver work well for removing these. While I'm at it, I pull out any remaining finish nails in the walls that didn't come out with the trim. I work my way around the room until the floor and walls are free of any nails and staples. Once the room is clean, I can start to lay out my flooring. I'm using vinyl plank flooring that interlocks together and floats on top of a plywood subfloor. The first and one of the most important steps of installing this type of flooring is to leave a quarter inch gap between the edge of the flooring and the walls around it. I use scrap quarter inch plywood to create this gap. This brand of flooring uses tabs and grooves to interlock together. I remove the tabs that go against my walls so that they set flush against my plywood spacers. I set my first piece in place and start on my second. Again, I remove the tabs on the side that faces the wall. Then, slide the tabs of my new piece into the slots on the existing piece of flooring. This section of floor has a cutout for the heat vent. I'll cut my flooring to match this opening. Using a speed square, I mark the length and placement of the opening on the flooring. Then mark the width that I need to remove and connect these lines. With my marks laid out, I can score the lines and remove the unwanted section. Once the gap in the flooring matches the one in the subfloor, I reinstall the two pieces of flooring together and make sure that I've maintained my quarter inch gap against the wall. The next piece needs to be cut to length. I measure the distance and subtract a quarter of an inch. Then mark, score, and break the flooring to fit that measurement. I remove the tabs from the side that faces the wall and install the last piece of my first row. For the second row, we won't be starting with a full piece. If we did, the seams would line up and that's a look I want to avoid. I'm going with a brick mold pattern, which means every other row will line up. If you don't like this look, you can go with randomized lengths so that your seams don't line up in any specific order. I slide my newly cut plank into the first row of flooring at an angle and lay it flat to lock it into place. My next piece also needs a cutout for the vent. I follow the same process as I did before. First, mark both sides to determine my length. Next, measure for width, define the lines, cut on those lines. 
I like to make two or three passes with the utility knife on each line. Then finally, I snap the edges of the lines that I scored and work my way back to the corners and break off the rest of the piece. I lock the flooring in, then set the vent back into place to make sure that it still fits. Next, we come to the first section that doesn't need any cuts or changes. I grab a full plank, insert the tabs into the slots on the side, then, lifting both of my pieces up slightly, slide the tabs into the back. The next plank needs to be cut to length and have a cutout for the wall. I first cut it to length, and this time I don't even use a tape measure. I just line the new plank up with the one that I just installed, and make sure to keep the end a quarter of an inch from the wall, then mark and cut it. Once cut, I flip the plank around so that the cut edge is facing the wall. I mark the cutout I need to make first for width, using the wall as a guide, and then for length. I score my lines and break them in the same way that I did for the floor vent. These planks have enough flex in them to get my tabs into place, but be careful with a piece like this. It's easy to snap a thin section in half or accidentally break the tabs off, causing the flooring to not lock in correctly. One of my favorite things about this type of flooring is that it can be installed easily from both sides. I measure, mark, and cut a new plank and install it on the back of the piece I just laid. With the first and second row all done, I can move on to my third and the next few rows as well. These will move much more quickly because I don't have any obstacles to work around. We started the last row with a half piece, so this time we're going with a full. Then, another full plank right next to it. While we're over here, I get my next row started. I line the plank up with the half piece that I installed earlier, mark it so they're the same length, cut it and install it. My half pieces are slightly under half the total length of a plank. This way I can keep the cut off piece I just made and with one more cut, I can have the next half piece with almost no waste. I install two more full planks, one next to the one I just cut and one more to get the new row started. I switch to the other side of the room and start to finish up these rows. I use scrap pieces to cut the small sections I need to finish rows like these. This part of the project moves quickly, which is a great feeling, but just remember to keep your eye on the pattern and make sure that it stays consistent and that you're maintaining your quarter inch gaps between the flooring and the walls. Everyone learns differently, but for me, repetition and visuals get the knowledge to stick in my brain. So instead of explaining each cut like we have been up until this point, let's talk about a few decisions to make surrounding this type of flooring as we finish installing it. But first, let's take a minute to look at this week's sponsor. If you've ever been interested in security camera monitoring, but have hesitated due to the cost or complexity of the system, then Blue Rams may be a good fit for you. Specifically, the Blue Rams Outdoor Light 4 security camera. This weather-resistant camera has 3 megapixel high-definition resolution and color night vision. It also includes motion-detected or manually operated spotlights, as well as an optional siren and two-way mic. The photos and videos can be recorded using either an SD card or through Blue Rams app. Both the camera and app set up quickly and are easy to use. This camera is available now on Amazon for $39.99, and with the 30% discount code found in the description of this video, is lowered to only $27.99. If you're at all interested, click on the link in the description to bring you to Blue Ram's Amazon page, where you can learn a lot more about their products. And now, back to the video. If you're thinking about replacing a floor, there's a few decisions that will need to be made. One of the first being what you will replace it with. And that, for me, usually comes down to money. Although there were many options, including new carpet and sheet vinyl, I knew that I wanted one of three options. Vinyl plank directly on the subfloor, to raise my subfloor with half inch underlayment and then install vinyl plank, or hardwood. The vinyl plank flooring I'm using cost me about $4 per square foot. 
This room is 150 square feet, which comes out to roughly $600 to refloor this room. And although this flooring can be cut using power tools, as you've seen in this video, it works just fine with a pencil, utility knife, and a speed square. Three tools that together can be bought for under $20. An issue with this flooring is that it's only a quarter inch thick. And the carpet that we ripped out, as well as the flooring outside of this room, is three quarters of an inch thick. When I install it, it will cause a half inch height difference between this floor and the floor on the other side of the doorway. This size height difference doesn't go against any codes, and we can make or buy a transition that will look nice and avoid a tripping hazard. But some may not like the looks of the height differential. One way to eliminate this would be to first install half inch underlayment to the floor. Doing this would put the finished floor up to the same level as the rest of the floors. A room this size would take approximately six sheets of underlayment at around $50 a sheet, plus the cost of nails and construction adhesive. A total cost somewhere in the range of $350 to $400, or let's say about $2.50 per square foot. This option also requires access to a nail gun and either a circular saw or a table saw. The third option I considered was installing pre-finished three-quarter inch oak flooring to the room. This would have made it so I had no change in height, and when the floors do eventually get damaged, it could be sanded and refinished. An option that we don't have with vinyl plank. But the oak flooring I priced out was around $6 a square foot, and you'd need access to a floor nailer, air compressor, miter saw, table saw, and a finish nailer. These tools can be rented if you don't have access to them, but the rental costs still add up. Hardwood floors also have more of a learning curve. Although a professional can install them very quickly, if it's your first time, I would plan on it taking three to four times as long as vinyl plank flooring does. If you need to rent the tools or hire someone who has them, plus the cost of the flooring, I would plan on about $8 a square foot to get this floor installed. So to recap, vinyl plank flooring, $4 a square foot or $600 for this room. Vinyl plank with underlayment, $650 a square foot or $975 for this room and hardwood, $8 a square foot or $1,200 for this room. I honestly don't think there's a right or wrong answer here, but I do think it's nice to have options when you're making a decision. As you know, we went with option one, the vinyl plank flooring, and we're really happy with it. But let me know what you would have gone with in the comments. And if you're enjoying the video, consider subscribing. We're almost done with this floor. My last row needs to be cut to width to fit into place. I use a straight edge and a pencil to mark each plank, then score them with a utility knife and break the edges off in the same way that we've done on the rest of this floor. Finally, we come to the last piece, which gets cut and set into place just like all the rest, but with a greater sense of pride and accomplishment. With the floor complete, we move right on to installing the trim. I've decided to go with a slightly taller trim to cover up the marks left by my old trim. We're also going to attempt to have no seams on each of the walls. And the first step to doing this is to get an accurate measurement of each wall. Instead of measuring by bending the tape or by adding the length of the case to your measurement, I like to make a mark 10 inches from the wall then measure to that mark from the opposite wall. Here I got a measurement of 126 and 3 8 inches plus the 10 inches from my mark to the wall, which means I will cut my trim to 136 and 3 8 inches. This is the most accurate way I've found to measure between two walls. I'm going to be using a miter saw to make these cuts, but before we cut our actual trim, I always like to make a test piece that I can refer back to for the rest of the project. On it, I make two cuts, one for an inside corner and one for an outside corner. I also mark these cuts to reduce any confusion. There's nothing worse than cutting a 12 foot long board, setting it into place and realizing you've cut the miter backwards. The two long walls both need inside corners on each side. 
I make these cuts, but before installing them, I measure and cut a few more sections of trim. This section needed an inside corner on one side and a butt joint on the other. All of my trim will have some configuration of inside corners, outside corners, and butt joints. Once you've got a hang of the placement your saw and boards need to be to get these cuts, the trim install should go pretty quickly. Just try to take accurate measurements of the wall and of the trim when you're cutting it. As I go, I test fit each piece and make adjustments as needed. And don't be too hard on yourself if a piece of trim doesn't fit perfectly the first time. About half my pieces are just a little too long on the first cut and need to be trimmed slightly. And if it's cut a little too short, no big deal. Trim is cheap, just cut another piece. If you don't have access to a miter saw, you can pick up a miter box and hand saw for around $20, which can make all of these cuts without too much more effort. Once I have all my trim cut, I set it into place and use my finish nailer to attach it to the wall. This trim is primed but not painted. To keep it looking clean for as long as possible, it's a good idea to fill your nail holes with caulking and paint all your trim with a semi-gloss paint once it's in place. I'm not going to include that process in this video, but if you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out. The last step of this project is to make transition strips for the doorways where this new floor meets the existing floor. There are plenty of great options for a transition here, including vinyl reducers and quarter round. But I've decided to buy an oak threshold, rip it in half, and get two transitions out of it. I measure the doorway width and cut my transition to size. Once my transition fits in the doorway, I make a mark for a rabbit so it can overlap the tile on the other side of the door. Once marked, I set the height of my table saw's blade an eighth of an inch lower than the top of my transition and make a cut to start my rabbit. I make another cut to widen it, then finally turn it on its side to clear out the rest of the material. After my rabbit is made, I run the piece through the saw one more time and add a chamfer to the rabbited edge so it won't splinter away or catch your toe. I add some oil-based finish that will darken the transition to close to the same color as the flooring. Then, finally, set it into place and secure it with some finish nails. You can use trim screws here if you prefer. Either way, just make sure that you go directly into the subfloor below, not through the tile or the vinyl plank. And with that, this project is done. We found this type of flooring to be a huge improvement to carpet in our house. It's a flooring that is reasonably priced and that anyone can install with almost no tools. If this is a flooring you've considered, I hope that this helps in your decision making or gives you the confidence to try it out. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.